Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ron Vail from Genelia Research Campus, and I'd like to welcome everyone again to Life Science Across the Globe, a Sister Institute seminar series. Uh, last week, we were in India, and we heard uh, great talks about wildlife and wildlife conservation. And uh, today, we travel to uh, visit our friends in China, in Beijing. And we welcome our sister institute, uh, the Center for Life Sciences. Um, I had the great pleasure of visiting uh, the Center for Life Science in Beijing uh, a year ago uh, when travel was possible. And I was very impressed uh, by the, what was going on there and the quality of science that is uh, happening in, in China and Beijing. And the Center for Life Science represents uh, kind of a virtual institute which uh, combines uh, some of the top scientists at Peking University and Tsinghua University, which are located adjacent to one another in Beijing and are considered to be the top universities in China. So you'll learn more about this special Center for Life Science in our second talk today. Uh, but right now, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, Yi Gong Shi. Uh, who will uh, introduce the speakers. Uh, Yi Gong is a professor at Tsinghua University. Uh, he, he is the first president of a new private university called Westlake University in China. And importantly, uh, he, along with Yi Rao, were the founders um, uh, almost a decade ago of the uh, Center for Life Sciences. So Yi Gong is one of the world's uh, leading scientists in structural biology, uh, and he's won uh, many honors for the work that he's done, including being uh, elected to as a foreign member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. And uh, he's really also instituted uh, um, many positive uh, changes and uh, reforms in, in the way science is conducted in China. So with that, uh, welcome uh, Yi Gong, and uh, it, it's very nice to have you and Beijing as part of this series. Thank you very much, Ron, for that very nice and warm introduction. I'm actually at the moment staying in Hangzhou, this very nice city in um, Southeast China, and only a hundred miles away from Shanghai. Um, I have the honor of introducing two speakers from Beijing, uh, the so-called Center for Life Sciences, one from Tsinghua and the other from Beida, uh, Peking University. Uh, so the first speaker will be Professor Hai Qi. He is currently Professor of Immunology in the School of Medicine, Tsinghua University. Hai received his PhD from Department of, Department of Pathology University of Texas Medical Branch Galveston in 2003. Before joining Tsinghua in 2009, Hai did his postdoctoral research with Dr. Ron Germain at NIAID, NIH in the US. Hai's laboratory tries to understand how antibody responses are regulated at the molecular, cellular, and organismal levels in a hope to improve vaccine development and develop better ways to control autoimmune diseases. Hai is an HHMI Gates International Research Scholar and has received quite a few awards, including the American Association of Immunologists Investigator Award. Uh, that concludes my introduction of Hai Qi, an immunologist from Tsinghua. All right, thanks, Yi Gong, for that nice introduction. And I'm really glad to be part of the series. And uh, my lab, as, as introduced, really focus on um, regulation of the humoral immune responses, in particular the germ center uh, structure, as sort of shown in this uh, video clip of uh, intravitreal microscopy. So this is really the place where uh, B cells will hypermutate its antibody coding genes, and then um, be selected based on that affinity of this. Uh, antibody and output as either memory B cells or plasma cells eventually produce the antibody that protect us about our body against uh, um, an infection. And I guess that's a particularly relevant in today's world uh, in the face of a pandemic of COVID-19. If ever we get a successful long-lasting vaccine, it's most likely based on a neutralizing antibody that uh, 
uh, have a pretty good affinity coming out of a German central response against this virus. But today I'm going to, uh, rather than give a very classic uh, immunology talk, but I, I, I want to discuss a question that I have for a long time, is whether uh, the nervous system would control the adaptive immune system in any way. And this question really come from rather somewhat to other to some people is scary picture this is actually a, a picture taken from 1980s in beijing a, a group of people were doing this qigong and the meditation uh, uh practice where people would report they have uh, personally experience of a positive effect on their health so that's a very subjective measurement of uh, uh the effect of this sort of a, a, a mind and the body uh, practice but so that's always in my mind. The question is whether there's actually more um, objective evidence of how the brain would work with the immune system. And in fact, uh, obviously there are established a paradigm of how nervous system talk to the immune system, not the least is HPA axis. When the, the, the animal or, or human enters stress, so there are a special uh, a group of uh, neurons in our brain, the paraventricular nucleus, they would produce uh, uh, the so-called corticotrophin releasing hormone or CRH that released into the portal vein of the uh, uh, pituitary uh, gland that will work on the corticotroph uh, uh, cells that release ACTH that go through the general circulation, uh, then uh, uh, act on uh, the cortex of adrenal gland uh, to stimulate the release of corticosterone or cortisol uh, in the case of a human. And that's uh, basically a way to uh, manage the energy consumption or um, uh, metabolism in the whole body. And that, its main effect on the immune system, however, is very immunosuppressive. In fact, this is the, uh, the sort of uh, single most important anti-inflammatory uh, drug, if you will, that people could use to treat autoimmune disease. So the feature of this uh, uh, nervous uh, and immune connection is that this HPA axis works through the general circulation and it's a neuroendocrine and it's immunosuppressive. But is there a immunostimulatory uh, effect of nervous system on the immune system is really our question. But before I go into the detail of our study, also important to introduce a previous uh, pioneering work from uh, Kevin Tracy and Associates that shows that uh, another way of, of uh, uh, the brain and, uh, and uh, immune connection in that they mainly based on uh, uh, Vegas stimulation that people can observe very potent immunosuppressive effect uh, of this uh, uh, Vegas stimulation and in fact, it is so strong that it can be used to treat uh, autoimmune disease. And it's mainly based on uh, this vagus stimulation causing a, a, a group of T cells called uh, CHAT T cell or choline esterase transferase expressing T cell that can make acetylcholine and this acetylcholine will act on macrophage, which is the producer of uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF. So you suppress the macrophage, then you suppress the pro-inflammatory cytokine, and then you could potentially uh, manage the inflammatory diseases. So this is another way of how the brain talks to the immune system. But again, this is immunosuppressive, and, and this is a, a main target cell as a macrophage, which is that innate group of cells which doesn't have an antigen binding uh, or clonally distributed antigen binding receptor. So our question is really, so, so if we really can use a brain to enhance the immune system, whether there's a direct immunostimulatory sort of circuit or pathways that go from the brain directly into uh, the, uh, the adaptive lymphocytes. So that's uh, what we want to explore. And uh, because I might run out of time at the end, so I want to acknowledge the people who done the work. Uh, the, uh, before I uh, tell you the story, it's, it, this is a, a, a long, uh, what I'm going to present to you is really a, a result of a long-standing uh, collaboration with many groups. And in my lab is a very talented graduate student, Xu Zhang, together with uh, his uh, colleague uh, Li Zhang, to graduate student in my lab, work with Yuan Yuan, graduate student in uh, uh, Dr. Ji Hu's lab at the Shanghai Tech, and Bo Lei, a graduate student uh, from Dr. Yi Zhong's lab at Tsinghua, and also helped by Dr. Fu Qiang Xu and uh, Sen Ji and, and many others uh, over the last eight years in order to figure out uh, this, this connection. So initially our strategy is really um, in, in the preferred model of a mouse as a immunologist, we have all the genetic tool and the many perturbation method in this model system that where we can dissect the molecular and the cellular interactions. We wonder whether we can create a system or we can, we can denervate a lymphoid organ. So uh, anatomically, you know, the spleen is supplied by a splitting nerve that can be isolated, uh, that coming out of the, the ciliac ganglion. 
And so, so what she did initially is in the mouse, try to figure out a surgical way of, of uh, uh, denervate the spleen. So he, uh, after some times of uh, messing around, and eventually he, he, he uh, established a protocol where we can surgically expose the vasculature where the, the, the nerve plexus is going to the spleen, that can, he can use the absolute alcohol to dissolve the, the, the nerve. And uh, what the end result is, well, before the end result is normally in the spleen, uh, as we know, it, this spleen nerve is mainly noradrenergic that can be stained with uh, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, uh, uh, one of the key enzymes that's to make the neurotransmitter. And you can see the uh, nerve fibers distributed in uh, uh, between the B cell follicle where B cells leave and, and the T cell zone where T cells leave and also in between the B cell follicle. And for immunologists, uh, it's a very obvious. This is the place where important cellular interaction uh, take place at the beginning of the immune response or during the immune response. So the nerve is distributed in this place. But after the generation surgery, the general structure of the spleen is intact. The, 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 the B cell follicle and T cell zone are still there, except the nerve disappeared. So with this model, then we can ask what's the consequence for adaptive immune response. So the first set of experiments is really simple. So we denervate the mice or, or sham operators. Everything else is exactly the same, except that we are not applying alcohol, but just simply uh, saline or PBS. Then we let the uh, mouse recover for six weeks because it's kind of major surgery. Uh, then we immunize with NPKH. The name for non-immunology is not important. It's really just a model antigen to trigger the immune system to make a response, to make antibody. And, 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 and the germinal center response to this, uh, to this protein. So we measure those responses uh, over a two weeks period where the mouse will generate a, a germinal center, which I briefly introduced at the beginning of my talk. And then also plasma cells that, that can produce antibody, which is the end product, if you will, of the immune response uh, as a, a cellular product. So, so this is just to show you uh, at a two time point after immunization, one week or two weeks, uh, and sham operated or denervated, uh, the, how their germinal center would look like. And this is just the quantitation. So uh, at this two time point, actually denervation doesn't affect the germinal center response. However, if you look at the spring plasma cell formation, then we can see in the sham operated mice that, that by day four, 13, this is the level of their plasma cells, but the, the denervated mice couldn't generate as many plasma cells following the immunization, suggesting uh, 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 this deservation definitely has an effect on uh, the adaptive immune response. So for the sake of time, I'm not going through a lot of data, but just to tell you, we have functional evidence to suggest uh, by testing different uh, neurotransmitter that B cell intrinsic responsiveness to acetylcholine is actually required for optimal uh, 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 plasma cell formation. And so we, we make a connection whether uh, the B cell is responding to a particular neurotransmitter as a result of, of, of uh, um, uh, uh, spring and nerve activity. So well, then we, we surveyed the B cell intrinsic expression of a different acetylcholine receptor, and it turned out in the immune cells, they mainly express a nicotinic form of acetylcholine receptor, which is mainly pentameric. pentameric. So they compose a different uh, ratio of alpha, beta uh, uh, subunit. And the B cells intrinsic express alpha 9, beta 1, beta 4, as measured by RT-PCR. And we use CRISPR-Cas9, just knock out individual of them, um, to, to, in order to test the result, uh, the, the effect, the beta-1 knockout. I just say that uh, we never got a like, real knockout, because uh, uh, presumably due to embryonic lethality. And the beta-4 knockout, we get the uh, live leader, but they, they, uh, um, uh, they reproduce pretty poorly. Uh, we only get the once a while uh, later. After nine knockout, they, they uh, uh, um, uh, generate offspring at the correct Mendelian frequency, and the mouse is totally normal. So initial experiment, we use alpha nine knockout to test the B cell intrinsic responsiveness to acetylcholine, whether that's required for what it, we observe. And uh, because this is a germline knockout, we use a mu MT uh, alpha nine knockout mixed bone chimera to make a, a B cell specific uh, uh, lesion. So the way it works is the mu MT bone marrow that cannot generate any B cells. So we use that bone marrow stem cells to transfer into literally irradiated wild type mice. These, uh, will, uh, these cells will contribute no B cells. So all the B cells in this reconstructed animal will come from alpha 9 knockout. Of course, our control will be the, the wild type. So in these two sets of uh, um, uh, animal, we can, after immunization, we can see if the B cell cannot express alpha 9 knockout, their splenic plasma cells uh, production is reduced, while well, well, rise their DC response are comparable. 
So that's similar to what the, we observe with the spring degeneration. Um, so to take advantage of the precious fuel uh, beta-4 knockout that we have, we use an alternative strategy to test uh, the same question is we use mu MT mice as empty host because these cell, these mice cannot uh, make a B cell on, them, uh, on their own. So we can infuse intravenously wild type or alpha-9 knockout or beta-4 knockout B cells coming out of this, uh, this animal. Then we let them sit there for a week and then immunize with MPKH and, and measure the spring plasma cell formation in, in two weeks. And it turned out uh, whether we knock out alpha-9 or beta-4, the spring plasma cells formation is significantly reduced. That tells us that B cell intrinsic responsiveness to acetylcholine is really uh, uh, required for uh, the optimal splenic plasma cell for formation, and this response um, is uh, like, uh, mediated by alpha-9 and potentially also beta-4 subunit. So, but that, then the, the important question is really whether this acetylcholine receptor requirement depends on the spring nerve activity. And to test this, we basically want to denervate uh, uh, the mu and T mice. Then we transfer the wild type of alpha-9 knockout B cells into this denervated uh, um, animal than, than to measure their uh, uh, immune response. So the prediction is if it's really linearly uh, connected as a circuit, then we should be able to see uh, 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 the alpha-9 uh, uh, effect when there is an intact uh, a spleen nerve or in the sham operated group. But when there's no spleen nerve, there's no upstream signal, presumably, then the alpha-9 uh, uh, would ha wouldn't have that uh, uh, um, effect on the plasma cell formation. And that's indeed what we observe. So as shown here, so in the sham operated group, if we knock out alpha-9, then we can see a, a, a penalty for spring uh, plasma cell formation. If we denervate the mice, then the knockout has no effect compared to the, to the control. So that tells us this a piece of intrinsic acetylcholine receptor effect is downstream of the splenic nerve activity. But then the question is, you, I told you the splenic nerve is noradrenergic, but then the, the B cell need to respond to acetylcholine. So where's the missing link? So that, it, as I mentioned at the, uh, 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 earlier in my talk, the inflammatory reflex, there's a, this group of T cells that they can make uh, choline ester transferase uh, in order to make acetylcholine. And it turned out those T, chat T cells, they respond to norepinephrine, which can be released by the spleen nerve and produce acetylcholine. And these cells, when we use the reporter to label them, they are actually, many of them localized very close by to the nerve fiber together with the forming cluster of a spring plasma cells from in vivo, suggesting they're in the right location to perhaps respond to the, to the uh, uh, spring nerve uh, release of neurotransmitter, then relay uh, in the form of acetylcholine to uh, the B cells. And it, consistent with this model, then when you use a, a, a DTR specifically expressed by CHAT uh, T cells, then we deplete these cells, then the plasma cell formation is indeed reduced. So, Together, these, these uh, uh, data tell us the spleen nerve is connected to uh, the T-dependent B-cell response, uh, at least uh, in, in terms of uh, forming the uh, uh, plasma cells. So the next question is then, if spleen nerve really uh, um, uh, influencing how directly uh, uh, the B-cell response, then where in the brain that would operate the spleen nerve um, uh, then potentially gives this a brain and uh, uh, adaptive immune uh, uh, connection. So to test uh, or to find out the, the brain region, then we resort to um, a, a retrograde uh, uh, viral tracing. So basically uh, uh, we want to tr inject uh, the pseudorabi virus into the spleen and let it uh, uh, spread retrogradely into the central nervous system, into the brain, and to look at before uh, exactly where uh, the, uh, the, the uh, virus would spread. So we will basically uh, 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 sacrifice the mice at different time point after the injecting the uh, PRV into the spleen and, and, and um, uh, look at uh, where uh, um, the signal would locate. So, so by uh, the latest time point that we look at is day four, because by day five, the mice are really sick and they're dying. And by day four in the forebrain, there are two nuclei that are very prominently labeled. One is a uh, paraventricular nucleus, the other is a cent excuse me, um, central uh, amygdala. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, P, the PV is actually sit at top of the HPA axis that, and that's a, a stress pre processing center. And the activation of those uh, HPA axis, as I mentioned, is a potent immunosuppressive. 
Uh, and in a CEA, this is a center that, that sort of control the autonomic response to emotion, the fear or anxiety. And that it, what's interesting between this two uh, group is that they share one type of neuron uh, among these two nuclei is the CRH neuron. Uh, it, because the PVNC is at top of the HPA and the CRH neuron is the one that make the driving upstream uh, hormone. So this is the, the reporter that we can see they're very densely distributing the PVN. And in, in fact, C, CRH neuron also exists in the CEA. That give us a, a rather provocative hypothesis is whether this, uh, this uh, uh, CRH neuron that, that could potentially drive a neuroendocrine process of immunosuppression could also potentially operate the spring nerve in an immunostimulative way when it uh, uh, sends a descending signal through the uh, uh, direct neural pathway. So, so that's our question. And uh, to test this, then we, we resort to optogenetic uh, stimulation of this virus, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, neuron. So we basically uh, use the virus that can express the channel adopsin uh, in a crate dependent manner into the mice that, uh, uh, um, into the CRH iris cray mice. So these mice will express the cray under the CRH uh, uh, internal control. So uh, when the virus inject into the CEA and the PVN, uh, uh, um, uh, the CRH neuron uh, will express the channel adopsin. Then we can uh, implant uh, uh, the, the optical fiber in order to stimulate that. But for these mice, we also uh, conduct a surgery to expose the spinning nerve and place an electrode, an electrode uh, uh, wrapping around the spinning nerve and to ask when we uh, stimulate uh, the CENP and CRH neuron, what happens to the spinning nerve. And that's this is the result that we, we got. So before we, we shine the light to the neuron, uh, then there's a, uh, 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 the tonic activity or firing frequency is like this. But after uh, the light stimulation, then the firing rate is significantly increased. That, that tells us uh, this, uh, the, the CRH neuron in the C and P event are indeed connected to the spinning nerve. So whether this connection is functionally relevant, then we, we, we set up three sets of experiments. We want to ablate the neuron, we want to inhibit the new, uh, CRH neuron activity, or we can artificially activate the neuron activity to see whether there is a consequence for the immune response, and the readout will be the spinning the plasma cell formation. Um, in order to ablate the CRH neuron, so again, we use the virus injecting to the right uh, CA and PVM place, and that can express uh, uh, cast phase three in a CRH uh, create dependent manner. Uh, so our B6 control mice, or CRH iris CRAE, uh, 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 group will be ablation group because um, uh, uh, their uh, CRH neuron will basically express an active uh, caspase 3 and commit suicide uh, before we immunize the mice. Then two weeks later, then we measure uh, 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 their immune response. So what it turned out, again, there is some uh, minimum uh, difference in terms of the center formation, but there is a clear difference in terms of splitting the plasma cell formation. Again, that's consistent with we, what we observe with the alpha 9 knockout and spring denervation. So, um, uh, but there, there is a caveat of a, a cell ablation experiment because we have to ablate the cells you know, long before the immune response. Uh, one can argue there are secondary tertiary and uh, consequence after the cell disappears and not necessarily a direct effect. So we want to see whether we can use uh, inhibit neuronal activity uh, with a drag strategy. So, so now we use a, a virus that encode uh, HM4DI. So that's a GI coupled uh, a designer receptor that upon uh, CNO stimulation that will inhibit the neuronal activity. So we have B6 control or CRH iris cray, and that will be the inhibition group. Then we um, give the CNO uh, the designer drug in the drinking water in both group of mice. So the toxicity of the CNO is taken care of in this control. And over the course of the immunization, uh, we inhibit the CRH neuron, whether the cells are still there intact. Then we analyze uh, again two weeks later. And that's, uh, again, we observe there's a reduction of the spring the plasma cell formation, and there's a no difference in terms of the germ center formation. So this is a another loss of function that suggests the tonic activity of a CRH neuron in the normal mice uh, in the PVNC actually promotes the, the spring the plasma cell formation. So can we have a gain of function? Then we use a uh, a dread activation strategy where uh, the, uh, they, they express a GQ coupled designer receptor uh, in a cray dependent manner. Uh, so in CRH iris cray mice, if these uh, 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 CRH neuron express this receptor upon CNO stimulation, 
their firing rate would increase. And you want to ask whether that would have an enhancing effect of a splenic plasma cell formation. And, and here, we uh, basically, uh, over a five-day period of time before our analysis, uh, we uh, IP inject uh, uh, the CNO twice a day in order to activate this uh, uh, um, um, uh, neuron. And, and it turned out, now we indeed get a gain in function in terms of percentage uh, or the abundance of splenic blastomas formation following immunization, but we don't see an effect on the germinal center. So with these three sets of experiments, we, we are pretty confident that the CA and P and CRH neurons indeed operate the splenic nerve and, and regulate this T-dependent B cell response. But as a immunologist or as a physiologist, and then the question is, so what? So it, it, can there be um, uh, uh, a certain uh, behavior or, or, or um, at least in, I mean, even if in, in the case of human, uh, I, I, whether there's some kind of mental activity or meditation type of uh, things that could activate uh, such a potential circuit to, to enhance the immune uh, response. So in the mouse, of course, we cannot control how they think, but we can control uh, their body behavior. So whether there is a behavior paradigm that can operate this circuit to give us uh, immune modulation. But as I mentioned, CRH neurons sit at the top of the HPA axis, and the, the end result of the HPA activation is production of a cortical corticoid, which is potent immunosuppression. Indeed, we actually spent quite a, some time to go through uh, the, 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 the models that the uh, neuroscientists typically use to create a stress conditions such as physical restraint for swimming, tail suspension, foot shock. These are mainly immunosuppressive. But eventually we come up with a, 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 a paradigm that are of our own, we call it an elevated platform standing. So I will show you a little video of uh, what the mouse would do with this. It's basically they're sitting at top of a, a transparent a platform raised above the ground, uh, about one and a half meter. And once the mouse is there, it gets scared. It shows a sign of a, a acrophobic behavior. It, 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 it tried to um, sort of uh, um, look around, it, but he or she doesn't want to jump because he's scared. Uh, and uh, when the mouse is placed down here, if we use calcium photometry, we can clearly see the CRH neuron in the PVN and the CEA is activated as soon as the mouse is placed on the transparent platform. And three minutes or five minutes later, when you take it off, it, the, then the activity immediately comes back to uh, 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 the background. So the behavior definitely activates the CRH neuron. So the question is whether this, uh, this uh, uh, EPS behavior that can activate uh, the CRH neuron would really enhance the immune response. So we, we immunize the regular B6 mice, then we just uh, let the mouse sit on top of that platform three minutes one time and twice a day. Uh, for five days right before we measure the DC and the spring the plasma cell. What it turned out is the CPS behavior indeed enhanced spring the plasma cell formation and doesn't change the DC formation. So now the question, the behavior can activate the uh, CRH neuron, can promote the, the immune response in the spring. Does it depend on the spring nerve? So now we, we denervate the mice or sham operate and wait for six weeks and immunize then we measure the EPS effect. And what turned out is that when there is a spleen nerve, the EPS has an enhancing effect. When there's a no spleen nerve, the enhancing effect is dramatically reduced. But so far, I've been showing you a simple readout of spleen the plasma cell formation. And that's sort of limited by this is complete, a very complex sets of experiment. But with this result, now we can ask whether there's any specific antibody response is being modified by this behavior. And so that's what we tested. So because we are using NPKH immunization, we can use the haptin to test that the antigen specific IgG production after immunization. What we find out is over a two weeks of period, only that five day, three minutes, twice daily, EPS behavior we enhanced antibody production by 70%. And does it require the PVNCA uh, uh, CRH neuron? And the answer is yes, because if we ablate the CRH neuron, then this enhancing effect disappear. Does it require the spleen nerve? The answer is yes. If we, uh, if we denervate the, the spleen, then this enhancing effect disappeared. Does it require the uh, acetylcholine responsiveness of the B cells? And the answer is also yes. If we make a mu MT uh, alpha 9 not called chimera, where B cells are specifically deleted for alpha 9 then this enhancing effect completely disappeared. And it, so these data tells us that there's a, indeed a circuit 
And then when we look at the, the, the further downstream end result of if you immunize a mice, or in the future, uh, in the case of human, if you immunize human, the, the very long lived humor memory actually is stored in the bone marrow in the form of long lived plasma cells. So if we look at you know, day 27, where is uh, the starting time point where people can start to look uh, 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 as a long lived plasma cell compartment, we can actually see the EPS behavior also enhanced antigen specific bone marrow plasma cells abundance uh, following immunization in conjunction with uh, further increased and uh, specific antibody production and also uh, 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 the hypermutation rate that suggests that these cells are actually coming out of the germinal center. So although um, the, the, the effect that doesn't directly work on the germinal center, it's most likely work on the output from the germinal center, which eventually goes into the long leaf compartment. And that is what we want for um, uh, uh, vaccine. So before I finish up, uh, many people at that time would, would wonder, you know, what's this EPS behavior represent in comparison to other behavior paradigm that can activate the, the stress center, which is the CRS neuron in the PBN. So we compared actually EPS with this, uh, versus a more uh, standard protocol of a prolonged body restraint. And it, the differences are quite striking. So EPS will activate uh, 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 CRH neuron in the PBN and the CEA. The, the body restraint will uh, super activate uh, the uh, PBN CRH, but actually doesn't activate or actually somewhat suppress the C CRH neuron in uh, the CEA. And the two behavior paradigm uh, trigger the stress hormone differently. The EPS behavior indeed induces a level of uh, uh, corticosteroid production, but it is rapidly goes down within about an hour following the EPS. But the body restraint will have a much higher level of uh, corticosteroid that can last uh, for a much longer time. And the consistent with this, it actually uh, PBR is very immunosuppressive in that it doesn't uh, change the plasma cell, but actually really destroy the germinal center response itself. So um, that, it, 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 I don't have time to show you that if we block uh, uh, the, the, the corticosteroid uh, a, a hormone effect in the EPS uh, behavior, we tend to get a, a more pronounced immunostimulatory effect uh, uh, from the behavior. So that tells us there's indeed a, um, a, a balance of immunosuppression and uh, uh, immunostimulation as I will summarize uh, the main finding here. So basically the adaptive humor immunity can be enhanced by a direct neural pathway coming from the brain descending into the spleen. And there is a balance of immunosuppressive uh, 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 and even stimulatory effect of CRH neuron activation in that the you know, suppressive neuroendocrine is mainly worked through the bloodborne uh, pathway. The stimulatory, at least for our uh, split plasma cells measurement, is, it's mainly through the descending neural uh, uh, circuit. And so, so both are code and code of stress, but we think now the stress, this word, has to be more precisely categorized by you know, the type of particular type of neuron that can be activated in a circuit that can be engaged. And, and in terms of immunological consequences, it's vitally important to, to understand how different behavior that would uh, in, uh, uh, operate this different uh, circuit. And in order for the future that we can potentially in human have a behavioral modulation uh, uh, and a more uh, specific manipulation to enhance our immunocompetency. And instead of the scary picture of, uh, you know, people meditate or Qigong, uh, in, in that uh, um, dark environment, maybe uh, I think uh, 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 we can think of in the future, we will have a defined behavior paradigm that can, we know that can activate the immunostimulatory circuit in human, such as in this uh, 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 yoga picture. I'm sure it's under body uh, stress, but uh, after that, uh, it's, it's a relieving uh, uh, feeling and potentially also physically enhancing the immunocompetency. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I run over a little bit wrong over the time, but I think I have uh, acknowledged the people who have done the work in my lab, uh, Xu Zhang and uh, Li Zhang. This is the, the, the whole crew that uh, we are we are studying uh, uh, German Center Biology. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, that was a, a really fascinating talk. Um, we have a lot of questions from the audience, um, but yet only a few minutes um, to get to them. So I'm just going to go ahead and read some of them. Um, to sure. you. Um, so the first is from Bruce Stillman. Bruce wants to know that um, in the denervated spleen, which um, has a defect in B cell production, does does it, are are the other functions of the spleen still preserved? Uh, sure. 
that's a that's an important question. Uh, I mean, to the extent that we can, we we can tell, there's a, not much. Um, but um, in terms of blood cell, in in terms of the half life, I say the the senescent the red blood cells, uh, we didn't directly measure. And what we did control is that we look at the T independent response, which also is a very active immune response that requires cell uh, circulation participation, and that has absolutely no. Uh, uh, difference and the terminal center response actually happens. It's a highly proliferative, uh, and uh, apparently there's no difference. So I assume that it will consume a lot of energy because that's one of the you know bone marrow thymus and the terminal center are three places. Uh, also, perhaps the clips in the in the small intestine are the the place where where active cell proliferation uh, take place uh, in adult uh, animal, and, and that's no no difference. So. Um, yeah, I, I I wouldn't rule out you know the the, the denervation uh, uh, have uh, some effect uh, in terms of normal physiology, but uh, to the extent we tell uh, what we observe it cannot be explained by by those. Great, thank you. Um, next question is sort of a two part question from Bo Lee. He wants to know: um, Do the uh, the CRH neurons <laughs> directly innervate the spleen? Uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, also, yeah, sure, uh, sure. Are there other types of neurons that may also contribute to modulation of the spleen function? That's a great question. We uh, the first is definitely the multi uh, synapse because because uh, 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 the the PVN uh, CA search neurons began to be labeled by PRB around day end of day three, so that's that cannot be just monosynaptic con connection. Um, uh, but we are, but we are still mapping out the details, and there are other uh, neurons involved, and we are we are working on those too. Um, all right. So the next question um, is uh, from G two uh, Mayor. Is it possible to bypass the brain circuits by providing acetylcholine directly to the site of B cell production in the spleen and enhance the immunopotentiating? Response? Yeah. So so that that's uh, that's actually the experiment that we did. Uh, um, uh, um, well, uh, yeah, uh, in, in vitro, yes. Um, um, and we also, I mean, the, the, for, for the some data that I skipped to say the functional evidence, uh, so we have a way to, to a, a let the B cell to express uh, uh, um, um, uh, the, uh, the enzyme that degrade the acetylcholine, then we can see that in vivo, that's, that, that's actually the initial evidence that we collect. Uh, to, to tell us that the, the receptor, uh, uh, acetylcholine receptor. And infusing acetylcholine, um, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a harder to do because the, the, the half-life is so uh, um, uh, short, but in vitro that I can say, acetylcholine definitely has an effect of a promoting plasma cell uh, um, response. If you use uh, LPS to activate B cell and then dump the acetylcholine, then you enhance the plasma cell uh, production from that in vitro culture. All right, we're going to end with one last question from um, Jeremy Borniger. Um, it's, it's, again, a two-part question. In the tracing experiment, um, uh, he noted some signal in the lateral hypothalamus. Do you know what that um, population might be? And he also wants to know, um, do you think that there are other sympathetic output nuclei that control similar functions? And so he's specifically thinking about um, uh, work showing that dopaminergic VTA regulates adaptive immunity also. Yeah, the VTA. I um, I think uh, so. The I think that the uh, you're referring to the Nature Medicine uh, paper. Um, the VTA stimulation has an effect on IgM, um, but the, in terms of circuit, I think it's less worked out, at least from my reading of it, because uh, the denervation is based on uh, it's uh, the chemical denervation that really destroy all the. Um, 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 sympathetic nerve, uh, and and also it's not. I mean, it's, to me, it's not entirely clear in the in the in the brain itself, because uh, they are stimulating specifically dopaminergic neuron in the VTA, and what's the effect of uh, the 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 six um, uh, the drug is effect in the, in in the nervous system whether whether you it actually block it uh, even before the signal can come out of the central, uh, central nervous system. Uh, so uh, I, I think there is clearly effect. And uh, we are thinking about whether there's connection between VTA and uh, what, what we describe, uh, but we are not sure yet. So uh, I wouldn't rule out that there are um, 
fibers in the spleen nerve that actually connect to other neur uh, neuron group uh, in the brain. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that our data rule that out. Uh, we, we, um, but we, we can say is that this is uh, right now what we describe is definitely happening. And uh, whether other pathways, potential pathways can intersect with this, uh, such as even Vegas, um, um, I think it's possible. And just quickly, um, because I had the same question, um, in the tracing experiment, do, what, um, do you have any idea what the, uh, the signal in the lateral hypothalamus um, actually could have been? Uh, we, we, we're trying to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, okay. Um, thank you so much. Hi. I think we are going to move on to um, our second talk.